It is humanity's 40,000th year. This is a dark and terrible era where you will find little comfort or hope. Forget the power of technology and science. Forget the promise of progress and advancement. Forget any notion of common humanity or compassion. There is no peace amongst the stars, for in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. What has happened to 40k? Are these the final straws? The enemies of Grimdark have spilled over the ramparts and overthrown the Kingdom of Misery? The Grim might be dead. Long live the cute. Hey guys, Jay here. Welcome to Eons of Battle. And if you know anything about 40k, it's probably Buzz Lightyear looking guys who keep saying, BROTHER! And of course, Grim Dark. Throughout every edition of 40k, since the very beginning, there has always been the same page one description of the universe. Much like the inscription above the gates of hell that Dante saw, abandon all hope ye who enter here, 40k has a similar mantra. In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. This is flavor text to let you know what you are in for. This is no tale of personal responsibility, superhero story, or coming of age flick. This is serious business and it has been a big factor in making 40k unique and stand the test of time. But in its evolution, there has been a new trend, cute stuff, and it seems at odds with the core ideas of 40k. But first, let's define what is Grim Dark. Well, one definition could be a setting that is dystopian, amoral, and violent. It could also just mean a cruel fantasy setting. It could also mean the absence of hopeful elements or an inability to achieve any lasting victory or progress. Everyone is doing awful things to delay their inevitable destruction, excessive violence, a dark color palette, nothing good can ever be allowed to happen. So why is it so hard to nail down Grim Dark? Well, that is because in my opinion, 40k is more of a sandbox than anything. Everyone experiences 40k in their own unique way. One person could read a Space Marine novel and be swept up in the honor and sacrifice of these larger than life heroes while another person can read the same book and be spooked by the tragedy of these child soldiers who've had their humanity stolen from them and are forced to fight and die to propagate a failed society. Both readings are true from a certain point of view, and I think that's what makes 40k so magical to so many people, is that you can have your own interpretation and no matter what, you're probably correct. So the question is, does the grim darkness of the far future have room in the dark cockles of its dead heart? For cuteness. I saw these chibis while on eBay looking for more 40k models to buy, and I didn't think. I just bought. I love them and here they are. These excite me more than the McFarland Space Marine did. That thing is fun, but it doesn't feel as interesting to me. These took an artist to a reimagine a Space Marine and Sister of Battle in their own way, where the McFarland just took an engineer to change the scale number of a Primaris CAD file. The McFarland felt a little cash grabby and cynical. If we make Space Marine big, they buy. These feel like they were created with an audience in mind, someone who likes a little whimsical charm. And they don't look too bad. The paint is even okay, a decent head start on a base coat, and I think I can take advantage of it. I'm gonna paint these up, and while I do, I'm gonna let my thoughts percolate on what these cutesy toys mean for the future of our grim dark game. Usually whenever I tackle a new painting project, something I've never tried before, usually my skills will gradually increase as I go. So I think I'm gonna start with my least favorite chibi and end with my most favorite. So that means I'm going to end with the Sister of Battle and I'm gonna start with the Evisor Assassin. Moment of truth, let's see if the paint will stick. I put a red wash over his red armor and it worked, no problems. Then I threw some bright red paint onto my palette and used this to highlight the armor. Before, it was all red, it lacked contrast, and contrast is what I'm adding to fix these chibis. I wanted to go brighter with the red, so I added in some orange. I used just a little bit of this here and there to really push the contrast on the armor. Next, I added some silver chips to the armor using a small piece of foam. I dipped the foam into the paint and then carefully sponged this onto the armor. Evisors are not known for keeping their kit nice and tidy. 
He was looking pretty good. I took a blue and watered it down and then spread this all over his black body glove to tint it. Then I took a bright green and stippled this onto the top of his tubes. Then I washed his tubes with a dark green, just like his red armor. This added contrast that was not there before. I was super nervous when I sat down to paint these guys that the weird vinyl-y rubbery plastic these are made out of was going to be completely hydrostatic and no paint was going to want to stick to it. But actually, these guys are taking paint fantastic. I am so pleasantly surprised that this is actually working. And it looks great. I think the only thing left to do on this guy is to work on his dome. Take care of that skull helmet he's got. I started with a wash of brown to darken the details already present, like his head, studs, and teeth. Then I began painting, starting with a dark tan to create my shadows. Then working my way up with a highlight mixture. This is still darker than the original head, but brighter than my dark tan. After that I used a tan that was almost exactly the same as the original color. Then finally I used a very bright, pure tan to finish it off. Now with his head finished, I painted the studs black and as cute as his big blue eyes are, I think I can do better. I put silver on his studs, then it was time for his crazy eyes. I started by stippling a dark blue. I created a random pattern, then I added a lighter blue, making another random shape a little bit smaller. Then a brighter blue and smaller splotch, and then finally, white paint. What a little charmer this guy turned into. That worked surprisingly well and was a ton of fun. This is going to be a really, really cool project. Oh, I wish Games Workshop would commission more of these because they are super duper funny. Next up, the Grey Knight. And this one did not look great out of the factory, but the metal is nice and shiny. I am going to try out a wash. I will use an even split of Games Workshop blue wash, black wash, and wash medium. This will create that silvery polished look I want. I opened my pots and for washes, I actually prefer paint in pots as I like to take paint directly from the pot and put it onto the model. I don't need a middleman wet palette for washes. I push the washes around the model and this helps to blend my colors together. The blue will add a nice clean look and the medium will make sure that the model doesn't get too dark. Now that he doesn't look like a little league trophy, I actually like this toy. I highlighted the silver paint to fix anything that the washes made too dark. On his dick tabard and purity seals, I used the browns and tans that I prepared for my Evasaur's head. It's nice to use up what you have. Then I painted his purity seals red. Out of the factory, these didn't even get painted. I washed and highlighted the wax seals with the bright red. Then it was time for his sword, and I decided to do a classic Games Workshop power sword. I used black and white for my brightest and darkest areas of the sword and then filled in the rest with blue. Now he is looking proper. Now it's time to move on to the Admech boy. The Skitari are the foot slogging soldiers of Mars. They have their arms and legs amputated and replaced with robotic limbs because the flesh is weak and they shoot bullets laced with radiation because it's just evil enough for 40k. And this is the cutest Widow Skitari I've ever seen. So let's get a little paint on him. I started out by putting a black wash over his metal parts and a brown wash over the copper colored gun. Then I painted his sleeves red. The sleeves are sculpted into the model, but they were not actually painted red like they should be. While I waited for the washes to dry, I painted the glowing plasma coils with a blue wash. On his robotic parts, I used a bright silver to create my lightest reflections and highlights. Then I took the same color, mixed it with black, and used this to blend the brighter silver back into his dark metal color. I used a blue mixed with white to highlight the energy on his guns, and I worked this up in stages, and while I was doing this, I put it on his eyes too, to give his blank blue stare a little bit of life. I worked my way up and finished off with pure white. His red cloak was looking a little flat, so I mixed some black into red and added on some shadows. I really liked how this was looking, so I added more black and darkened these areas further. Then I took a bright red and gave the cloak an edge highlight. Now it was time for his gun, and for this I used a gold paint to highlight, and then I mixed my gold paint with silver paint and used this mixture for the final highlights. And just like that, this little Martian was done, now time for an Astardes. You might think that this space marine was already done, but I can do better. First I added a blue wash to everything. I made sure to remove the wash from the white symbols before it dried. I want to save those for later. And you know what else you should save for later? That's right, our Patreon. Over there we have lots of high quality terrain STLs available and it is the best way to support us making videos. In addition to great grimdark terrain, you will also gain access to one exclusive video a week, some behind the scenes, voting what models I paint live here on YouTube, a live hobby hangout every week, and more. Another great way to support us is by checking out our merch. You can follow the link in the description below to our shirts and sweatshirts with some fun hobby related designs. Now with that said, let's fix a Primaris Chibi. Now he has a lot more contrast, but he's a little bit too dark, so I went in with some Ultramarines blue and painted his parts, leaving the wash in the recesses. 
This is basically exactly how Games Workshop teaches you to paint a Space Marine. Once that was dry, I took a brighter blue and added this to the top parts of his arm, then blended them down with a damp brush. Then I took a really bright blue and did the same thing, just a little bit on the top of his arms, then blended it down. This is representing light shining down on his armor. I did this to all of him. It took a little work, but I think it was worth it. It added a lot to the marine. If you ever wanted to learn how to properly blend paint, which is something that's really, really challenging and I feel like I've barely got a grasp of it, I would definitely suggest painting something like this. These chibis have a lot of very big open areas that are flat spaces and it's really, really a good device. It's a good opportunity to practice some blending. On his bolter, I painted the metal parts metal and then gave those areas a wash. I painted the top parts of his gun with a bright red, classic Ultramarines. Then I picked out the rivets and his bolter was looking about a thousand times better. Look at this adorable Primera Space Marine. And now that I have some experience under my belt painting chibis, it's time to take what I know and put it into my favorite of these models, the Sister of Battle. I started off with a classic black wash over the red and silver details of her armor and her hair. To make her hair look more like hair and less like a bicycle helmet, I took a long bristled brush and dragged it across the head leaving long gray strokes. Then I put a red wash over the red cloak and now with two washes on there it was properly shaded. Then I moved on to a highlight. I used a red to edge highlight what was showing through the washes and then I did a smaller pass with a medium bright red and finished it off with just a little bit of truly bright red. I painted the chain around her waist with a gunmetal color. I like that these details exist in the sculpt even though they were not painted originally. They add a lot now that I can paint them. I put a black outline on her shoulder pads to give them a little bit more contrast and I added silver paint to the highlights and borders and rivets. I used a silver paint on the lower parts of her bolt pistol. Then it was time for her face. I painted over her black eyes with blue. Then I mixed some browns and added a scar across her face. This helped add some nice detail but the whole face was still looking really flat so I decided to paint it. I still need a lot more practice painting faces but I was able to add a little color into her cheeks some definition to her nose, and to make her face not one solid color. And there is the sister. Now let's compare all of these models to their originals and see if I was able to improve them. The Eversor Assassin was really fun because it was the first one and I was super nervous that the paint wasn't going to stick to it, but it did. And you know, I wasn't super stoked on the inclusion of the Assassin in this lineup of miniatures. I feel like it's kind of a weird pick. But now having painted it up, it's one of my favorites. I super duper love him and I wish that the real Evasaur Assassin stood on a 40mm base so that I could use this model in proxy in games of 40k. The Grey Knight definitely looks the most different between the pre-painted and the post-painted. I mean before it just looked like, like a silver foil gum wrapper and now it actually looks like something. And it looks really, really good. I got the opportunity to practice my power weapons and that was fun and I actually think his Storm Bolter on his wrist looks better than the real Grey Knight Stormbolter on the wrist. It just looks a little bit more in proportion. But this guy is gonna look great leading my Grey Knight army into battle. You could definitely tell with the pre-painted Skitari that is the one that they struggled with the most in terms of painting it. It did not look good and the big copper gun was probably the biggest question mark. But now that it's painted, it's definitely one of my faves. It's definitely the cutest of the bunch with his big owl eyes. The Skitari are a really, really fun newcomer to the 40k lineup, and I think this chibi is absolutely adorable. The Primaris Space Marine chibi. I know a lot of people are not big fans of the Primaris, and I think that those people are going to be even bigger fans of the chibi Primaris Space Marine, right? This model was super duper fun. I know Games Workshop still publishes this model in their advent calendar box that comes with a bunch of different chapter colors. And I would actually suggest seeking one out. If you're a Space Marine player and you would you are interested in a caricature of your chapter, I would definitely consider picking one of these up and giving it a paint. It's a really, really fun little project. And finally, the Sister of Battle. When this was unpainted, I thought it was the best looking of the bunch of these chibis. And now that it is painted, I actually found it just a little bit challenging. Black armor is always hard to do. And I think if I could do it again, I would give her power sword the same glowing effect as the Grey Knights. I think maybe down the road I might pick up another one of these and paint it in my Sister of Battle color scheme, but I'm still very pleased with this mini. These chibis worked out great. The paint stuck to them, they didn't break or fall apart, and they are just nice little toys. But the big burning question, is Grimdark dead and did these chibis kill it? In my opinion, no.
It is true that these chibis do not accurately depict the setting of the Grim Dark Universe, but luckily they don't live inside the Grim Dark Universe, they live inside our universe for us to appreciate. Does appreciating a different version of the thing I like mean that I hate the other version or that I have to pick one? No, clearly not. Let me give you an example of what I mean. In the movie series Godzilla, there is a monster called Biollante, and this is my Biollante. And she is so cute. This plushie is obviously a cute caricature of the original, and does this cuteness damage the image of the original? No, it really doesn't. I think it's the juxtaposition between how cute this is versus how not cute the real thing is that strengthens both. I can hold both contradicting emotions, and for me, it multiplies the fun I can have with it. I can be awed by the original size, scared of its monstrousness, and intrigued by its lore, while also thinking that this is the cutest, cuddliest, little killer plant ever, yes you are. If someone likes anything about this hobby, we should celebrate that. Whether it's painting, gaming, reading, or chibis, it's one more soul to swell our ranks, and isn't that worth it? Do we even want those people? If they don't like Grim Dark, they should find a new hobby. Yes. Yes, we do want those people. Without them, the hobby would crumble. In my time in the Warhammer sphere, I have seen that there is no one Wargamer, no true fan. There are tryhards, paintaholics, lore junkies, filthy casuals, video gamers, part-timers, neckbeards, sore losers, grognards, and bright-eyed newbies. And they are all important and necessary. All these different people brought together by this sci-fi game. They are all equal and they are all welcome in this hobby. Chibis are fun. Get over it.